This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. This Side of Paradise by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book One, Chapter Two, Part Three. Carnival. Amory, by way of the Princetonian, had arrived. The minor snobs, finely balanced thermometers of success, warmed to him as the club elections grew nigh, and he and Tom were visited by groups of upper-classmen who arrived awkwardly, balanced on the edge of the furniture, and talked of all subjects except the one of absorbing interest. Amory was amused at the intent eyes upon him and, in case the visitors represented some club in which he was not interested, took great pleasure in shocking them with unorthodox remarks. "'Oh, let me see,' he said one night to a flabbergasted delegation. "'What club do you represent?' With visitors from Ivy and Cottage and Tiger Inn he played the nice, unspoilt, ingenuous boy, very much at ease and quite unaware of the object of the call." When the fatal morning arrived, early in March, and the campus became a document in hysteria, he slid smoothly into cottage with Alec Connage, and watched his suddenly neurotic class with much wonder. There were fickle groups that jumped from club to club. There were friends of two or three days who announced tearfully and wildly that they must join the same club, nothing should separate them. There were snarling disclosures of long-hidden grudges, as the suddenly prominent remembered snubs of freshman year. Unknown men were elevated into importance when they received certain coveted bids. Others, who were considered all set, found that they had made unexpected enemies, felt themselves stranded and deserted, talked wildly of leaving college. In his own crowd Amory saw men kept out for wearing green hats— for being a damn tailor's dummy, for having too much pull in heaven, for getting drunk one night, not like a gentleman by God, or for unfathomable secret reasons known to no one but the wielders of the black balls. This orgy of sociability culminated in a gigantic party at the Nassau Inn, where punch was dispensed from immense bowls, and the whole downstairs became a delirious, circulating, shouting pattern of faces and voices. "'Hi, Dibby! Congratulations!' "'Good boy, Tom. You got a good bunch in cap.' "'Say, Carrie. Oh, Carrie, I hear you went tiger with all the weight-lifters. "'Well, I didn't go cottage. The parlor snake's delight. "'They say Overton fainted when he got his ivy bid. "'Did he sign up the first day? "'Oh, no. Tore over to Murray Dodge on a bicycle. "'Afraid it was a mistake. "'How'd you get into cap, you old Rue? "'Congratulations.' "'Congratulations yourself. Here you got a good crowd.' When the bar closed, the party broke up into groups and streamed, singing over the snow-clad campus, in a weird delusion that snobbishness and strain were over at last, and that they could do what they pleased for the next two years. Long afterward Amory thought of sophomore spring as the happiest time of his life. His ideas were in tune with life as he found it, he wanted no more than to drift and dream and enjoy a dozen new-found friendships through the April afternoons. Alec Connage came into his room one morning and woke him up into the sunshine and peculiar glory of Campbell Hall shining in the window. "'Wake up, original sin, and scrape yourself together. Be in front of Renwick's in half an hour. Somebody's got a car.' He took the bureau cover and carefully deposited it, with its load of small articles, upon the bed. "'Where'd you get the car?' demanded Amory cynically. "'Sacred trust, but don't be a critical goofer, or you can't go.' "'I think I'll sleep,' Amory said calmly, resettling himself and reaching beside the bed for a cigarette. "'Sleep?' "'Why not? I've got a class at eleven thirty. "'You damned gloom! Of course, if you don't want to go to the coast—' With a bound Amory was out of bed, scattering the bureau cover's burden on the floor. The coast! 
He hadn't seen it for years, since he and his mother were on their pilgrimage. "'Who's going?' he demanded, as he wriggled into his BVDs. "'Oh, Dick Humbert and Carrie Holiday and Jesse Farenby. And, oh, about five or six. Speed it up, kid!' In ten minutes Amory was devouring cornflakes in Renwick's, and at nine-thirty they bowled happily out of town, headed for the sands of Deal Beach. "'You see,' said Carrie, "'the car belongs down there. In fact, it was stolen from Asbury Park by persons unknown, who deserted it in Princeton and left for the West. Heartless Humbird here got permission from the city council to deliver it.' "'Anybody got any money?' suggested Farnby turning around from the front seat. There was an emphatic negative chorus. "'That makes it interesting. Money? What's money? We can sell the car. Charge him salvage or something.' "'How are we going to get food?' asked Amory. "'Honestly,' answered Carrie, eyeing him reprovingly. "'Do you doubt Carrie's ability for three short days? Some people have lived on nothing for years at a time. Read the Boy Scout Monthly.' Three days, Amory mused, and I've got classes. One of the days is the Sabbath. Just the same, I can only cut six more classes, with over a month and a half to go. Throw him out. It's a long walk back. Amory, you're running it out, if I may coin a new phrase. Hadn't you better get some dope on yourself, Amory? Amory subsided resignedly and drooped into a contemplation of the scenery. Swinburne seemed to fit in somehow. Oh, winter's rains and ruins are over, and all the seasons of snows and sins, the days dividing lover and lover, the light that loses, the night that wins, and time remembered is grief forgotten, and frosts are slain and flowers begotten, and in green underwood and cover, blossom by blossom, the spring begins. The full streams feed on flower of "'What's the matter, Amory? Amory's thinking about poetry, about the pretty birds and flowers. I can see it in his eye.' "'No, I'm not,' he lied. "'I'm thinking about the Princetonian. I ought to make up tonight, but I can telephone back, I suppose.' "'Oh,' said Carry respectfully, "'these important men.' Amory flushed, and it seemed to him that Farnby, a defeated competitor, winced a little. Of course Carry was only kidding— but he really mustn't mention the Princetonian. It was a halcyon day, and as they neared the shore and the salt breezes scurried by, he began to picture the ocean and long level stretches of sand and red roofs over blue sea. Then they hurried through the little town, and it all flashed upon his consciousness to the mighty pain of emotion. "'Oh, good Lord, look at it!' he cried. "'What?' "'Let me out, quick! I haven't seen it for eight years. "'Oh, gentlefolk, stop the car!' "'What an odd child,' remarked Alec. "'I do believe he's a bit eccentric.' The car was obligingly drawn up at a curb, and Amory ran for the boardwalk. First he realized that the sea was blue, and that there was an enormous quantity of it, and that it roared and roared, really all the banalities about the ocean that one could realize— but if any one had told him then that these things were banalities, he would have gaped in wonder. "'Now we'll get lunch,' ordered Carrie, wandering up with the crowd. "'Come on, Amory, tear yourself away and get practical.' "'We'll try the best hotel first, he went on, and thence and so forth. They strolled along the boardwalk to the most imposing hostelry in sight, and entering the dining-room scattered about a table. Eight Bronxes,' commanded Alec, and a club sandwich, and Julienne's, the food for one, hand the rest around. Amory ate little, having seized a chair where he could watch the sea and feel the rock of it. When luncheon was over they sat and smoked quietly. "'What's the bill?' Someone scanned it. Eight twenty-five. Rotten overcharge. We'll give them two dollars and one for the waiter. Carrie, collect the small change.' The waiter approached, and Carrie gravely handed him a dollar, tossed two dollars on the check, and turned away. They sauntered leisurely toward the door, pursued in a moment by the suspicious Ganymede. "'Some mistake, sir.' Carrie took the bill and examined it critically. 
"'No mistake,' he said, shaking his head gravely, and, tearing it into four pieces, he handed the scraps to the waiter, who was so dumbfounded that he stood motionless and expressionless while they walked out. "'Won't he send after us?' "'No,' said Carrie. "'For a minute he'll think we're the proprietor's sons or something. "'Then he'll look at the cheque again and call the manager, and in the meantime—' "'They left the car at Asbury, and street-card to Allenhurst, "'where they investigated the crowded pavilions for beauty. "'At four there were refreshments in a lunch-room, "'and this time they paid an even smaller per cent on the total cost. "'Something about the appearance and savoir-faire of the crowd made the thing go, "'and they were not pursued.' "'You see, Amory, we're Marxian socialists,' explained Carrie. "'We don't believe in property, and we're putting it to the great test.' "'Night will descend,' Amory suggested. "'Watch and put your trust in holiday.' They became jovial about five-thirty, and, linking arms, strolled up and down the boardwalk in a row, chanting a monotonous ditty about the sad sea-waves. Then Carrie saw a face in the crowd that attracted him, and, rushing off, reappeared in a moment with one of the homeliest girls Amory had ever set eyes on. Her pale mouth extended from ear to ear, her teeth projected in a solid wedge, and she had little squinty eyes that peeped ingratiatingly over the side-sweep of her nose. Carrie presented them formally. "'Name of Kaluka, Hawaiian Queen,' "'Let me present Messrs. Connage, Sloane, Humbird, Fernby, and Blaine.' The girl bobbed curtsies all around. Poor creature! Amory supposed she had never before been noticed in her life. Possibly she was half-witted. While she accompanied them—Carrie had invited her to supper—she said nothing which could discountenance such a belief. "'She prefers her native dishes,' said Alec gravely to the waiter. "'But any coarse food will do.' All through supper he addressed her in the most respectful language, while Carrie made idiotic love to her on the other side, and she giggled and grinned. Amory was content to sit and watch the by-play, thinking what a light touch Carrie had, and how he could transform the barest incident into a thing of curve and contour. They all seemed to have the spirit of it more or less, and it was a relaxation to be with them. Amory usually liked men individually, yet feared them in crowds unless the crowd was around him. He wondered how much each one contributed to the party, for there was somewhat of a spiritual tax levied. Alec and Carrie were the life of it, but not quite the centre. Somehow the quiet Humbird, and Sloane with his impatient superciliousness, were the centre. Dick Humbird had, ever since freshman year, seemed to Amory a perfect type of aristocrat. He was slender but well-built, black curly hair, straight features, and rather a dark skin. Everything he said sounded intangibly appropriate. He possessed infinite courage, an averagely good mind, and a sense of honour with a clear charm and noblesse oblige that varied it from righteousness. He could dissipate without going to pieces, and even his most bohemian adventures never seemed running it out. People dressed like him— tried to talk as he did. Amory decided that he probably held the world back, but he wouldn't have changed him. He differed from the healthy type that was essentially middle class. He never seemed to perspire. Some people couldn't be familiar with a chauffeur without having it returned. Humbird could have lunched at Sherry's with a coloured man, yet people would have somehow known that it was all right. He was not a snob, though he knew only half his class." His friends ranged from the highest to the lowest, but it was impossible to cultivate him. Servants worshipped him and treated him like a god. He seemed the eternal example of what the upper class tries to be. He's like those pictures in the illustrated London news of the English officers who have been killed, Amory had said to Alec. Well, Alec had answered, if you want to know the shocking truth, his father was a grocery clerk who made a fortune in Tacoma real estate and came to New York ten years ago. Amory had felt a curious, sinking sensation. This present type of party was made possible by the surging together of the class after club elections, as if to make a last desperate attempt to know itself, to keep together, 
to fight off the tightening spirit of the clubs. It was a let-down from the conventional heights they had all walked so rigidly. After supper they saw Kaluka to the boardwalk, and then strolled back along the beach to Asbury. The evening sea was a new sensation, for all its colour and mellow age was gone, and it seemed a bleak waste that made the Norse sagas sad. Amory thought of Kipling's "'Beaches of Lucanon before the sealers came.' It was still a music, though, infinitely sorrowful. Ten o'clock found them penniless. They had suppered greatly on their last eleven cents, and, singing, strolled up through the casinos and lighted arches on the boardwalk, stopping to listen approvingly to all band concerts. In one place Carrie took up a collection for the French war orphans, which netted a dollar and twenty cents, and with this they bought some brandy in case they caught cold in the night. They finished the day in a moving picture show, and went into solemn, systematic roars of laughter at an ancient comedy, to the startled annoyance of the rest of the audience. Their entrance was distinctly strategic, for each man as he entered pointed reproachfully at the one just behind him. Sloane, bringing up the rear, disclaimed all knowledge and responsibility as soon as the others were scattered inside. Then, as the irate ticket-taker rushed in, he followed nonchalantly. They reassembled later by the casino, and made arrangements for the night. Carey wormed permission from the watchman to sleep on the platform, and, having collected a huge pile of rugs from the booths to serve as mattresses and blankets, they talked until midnight, and then fell into a dreamless sleep, though Amory tried hard to stay awake and watch that marvellous moon settle on the sea. So they progressed for two happy days, up and down the shore by street-car or machine, or by shoe-leather on the crowded boardwalk, sometimes eating with the wealthy, more frequently dining frugally at the expense of an unsuspecting restaurateur. They had their photos taken, eight poses, in a quick development store. Carey insisted on grouping them as a varsity football team, and then as a tough gang from the east side, with their coats inside out, and himself sitting in the middle on a cardboard moon. The photographer probably has them yet, at least they never called for them. The weather was perfect, and again they slept outside, and again Amory fell unwillingly asleep. Sunday broke stolid and respectable, and even the sea seemed to mumble and complain, so they returned to Princeton via the fords of transient farmers, and broke up with colds in their heads, but otherwise none the worse for wandering. Even more than in the year before, Amory neglected his work, not deliberately, but lazily, and through a multitude of other interests. Coordinate geometry and the melancholy hexameters of Corneille and Racine held forth small allurements, and even psychology, which he had eagerly awaited, proved to be a dull subject full of muscular reactions and biological phrases, rather than the study of personality and influence. That was a noon class, and it always sent him dozing. Having found that, "'Subjective and objective, sir,' answered most of the questions, he used the phrase on all occasions, and it became the class joke when, on a query being levelled at him, he was nudged awake by Farrenby or Sloane to gasp it out. Mostly there were parties, to Orange or the Shore, more rarely to New York and Philadelphia, though one night they marshalled fourteen waitresses out of Childs, and took them to ride down Fifth Avenue on top of an autobus. They all cut more classes than were allowed, which meant an additional course the following year, but spring was too rare to let anything interfere with their colourful ramblings. In May Amory was elected to the sophomore prom committee, and when after a long evening's discussion with Alec they made out a tentative list of class probabilities for the senior council, they placed themselves among the surest. The senior council was composed presumably of the eighteen most representative seniors, and in view of Alec's football managership and Amory's chance of nosing out Burn Holiday as Princetonian chairman, they seemed fairly justified in this presumption. Oddly enough, they both placed Dinvillers as among the possibilities, a guess that a year before the class would have gaped at. All through the spring Amory had kept up an intermittent correspondence with Isabel Borge, 
punctuated by violent squabbles, and chiefly enlivened by his attempts to find new words for love. He discovered Isabel to be discreetly and aggravatingly unsentimental in letters, but he hoped against hope that she would prove not too exotic a bloom to fit the large spaces of spring as she had fitted the den in the Minnehaha Club. During May he wrote thirty-page documents almost nightly, and sent them to her in bulky envelopes exteriorly labelled Part One and Part Two. "'Oh, Alec, I believe I'm tired of college,' he said sadly, as they walked the dusk together. "'I think I am, too, in a way. "'All I'd like would be a little home in the country, some warm country, and a wife, and just enough to do to keep from rotting.' "'Me, too.' "'I'd like to quit.' "'What does your girl say?' "'Oh!' Amory gasped in horror. "'She wouldn't think of marrying. "'That is, not now. "'I mean the future, you know.' "'My girl would. "'I'm engaged.' "'Are you really?' "'Yes. "'Don't say a word to anybody, please, but I am. "'I may not come back next year.' "'But you're only twenty. "'Give up college?' "'Why, Amory, you were just saying a minute ago—' "'Yes,' Amory interrupted. "'But I was just wishing. "'I wouldn't think of leaving college. "'It's just that I feel so sad these wonderful nights. "'I sort of feel they're never coming again, "'and I'm not really getting all I could out of them. "'I wish my girl lived here. "'But marry? Not a chance, "'especially as father says the money isn't forthcoming as it used to be. "'What a waste these nights are,' agreed Alec. But Amory sighed and made use of the knights. He had a snapshot of Isabel, enshrined in an old watch, and at eight almost every night he would turn off all the lights except the desk lamp, and sitting by the open windows with the picture before him, write her rapturous letters. "'Oh, it's so hard to write what you really feel when I think about you so much. You've gotten to mean to me a dream that I can't put on paper any more. Your last letter came, and it was wonderful.' I read it over about six times, especially the last part, but I do wish sometimes you'd be more frank, and tell me what you really do think of me. Yet your last letter was too good to be true, and I can hardly wait until June. Be sure and be able to come to the prom. It'll be fine, I think, and I want to bring you just at the end of a wonderful year. I often think over what you said on that night, and wonder how much you meant. If it were anyone but you— "'But you see, I thought you were fickle the first time I saw you, "'and you are so popular and everything "'that I can't imagine you really liking me best.' "'Oh, Isabel, dear, it's a wonderful night. "'Somebody is playing Love Moon on a mandolin far across the campus, "'and the music seems to bring you into the window. "'Now he's playing Goodbye, Boys, I'm Through, and how well it suits me. "'For I am through with everything. "'I have decided never to take a cocktail again.' "'and I know I'll never again fall in love. "'I couldn't. "'You've been too much a part of my days and nights "'to ever let me think of another girl. "'I meet them all the time, and they don't interest me. "'I'm not pretending to be blasé, because it's not that. "'It's just that I'm in love. "'Oh, dearest Isabel! "'Somehow I can't call you just Isabel, "'and I'm afraid it'll come out with the dearest "'before your family this June. "'You've got to come to the prom, "'and then I'll come up to your house for a day, "'and everything will be perfect.' and so on, in an eternal monotone that seemed to both of them infinitely charming, infinitely new. June came, and the days grew so hot and lazy that they could not worry even about exams, but spent dreamy evenings on the court of cottage, talking of long subjects until the sweep of country toward Stony Brook became a blue haze, and the lilacs were white around tennis courts and words gave way to silent cigarettes. Then down deserted prospect, and along Macosh with song everywhere around them, up to the hot joviality of Nassau Street. Tom Dinvier and Amory walked late in those days. A gambling fever swept through the sophomore class, and they bent over the bones till three o'clock many a sultry night. After one session they came out of Sloane's room to find the dew fallen and the stars old in the sky. "'Let's borrow bicycles and take a ride,' Amory suggested. "'All right. I'm not a bit tired, and this is almost the last night of the year, really, because the prom stuff starts Monday.' 
they found two unlocked bicycles in Holder Court and rode out about half past three along the Lawrenceville Road. What are you going to do this summer, Amory? Don't ask me. Same old things, I suppose. A month or two in Lake Geneva. I'm counting on you to be there in July, you know. Then there'll be Minneapolis, and that means hundreds of summer hops, parlor snaking, getting bored. But oh, Tom, he added suddenly, hasn't this year been slick? No, declared Tom emphatically, a new Tom, clothed by Brooks, shod by Franks. I've won this game, but I feel as if I never want to play another. You're all right, you're a rubber ball, and somehow it suits you, but I'm sick of adapting myself to the local snobbishness of this corner of the world. I want to go where people aren't barred because of the color of their neckties and the roll of their coats. You can't, Tom, argued Amory as they rolled along through the scattering night. Wherever you go now, you'll always unconsciously apply these standards of having it. Or lacking it. For better or worse, we've stamped you. You're a Princeton type. Well, then, complained Tom, his cracked voice rising plaintively, why do I have to come back at all? I've learned all that Princeton has to offer. Two years more of mere pedantry and lying around a club aren't going to help. They're just going to disorganize me, conventionalize me completely. Even now I'm so spineless that I wonder how I get away with it. Oh, but you're missing the real point, Tom, Amory interrupted. You've just had your eyes opened to the snobbishness of the world in a rather abrupt manner. Princeton invariably gives the thoughtful man a social sense. You consider you taught me that, don't you? he asked quizzically, eyeing Amory in the half dark. Amory laughed quietly. Didn't I? Sometimes, he said slowly, I think you're my bad angel. I might have been a pretty fair poet. Come on, that's rather hard. You chose to come to an Eastern college. Either your eyes were opened to the mean scrambling quality of people, or you'd have gone through blind, and you'd hate to have done that, been like Marty Kay. Yes, he agreed, you're right. I wouldn't have liked it. Still, it's hard to be made a cynic at twenty. I was born one, Amory murmured. I'm a cynical idealist. He paused and wondered if that meant anything. They reached the sleeping school of Lawrenceville and turned to ride back. It's good, this ride, isn't it? Tom said presently. Yes, it's a good finish. It's knockout. Everything's good tonight. Oh, for a hot, languorous summer. And Isabel. Oh, you and your Isabel. I'll bet she's a simple one. Let's say some poetry. So Amory declaimed the ode to a nightingale to the bushes they passed. I'll never be a poet, said Amory as he finished. I'm not enough of a sensualist, really. There are only a few obvious things that I notice as primarily beautiful women, spring evenings, music at night, the sea. I don't catch the subtle things like silver snarling trumpets. I may turn out an intellectual, but I'll never write anything but mediocre poetry. They rode into Princeton as the sun was making colored maps of the sky behind the graduate school, and hurried to the refreshment of a shower that would have to serve in place of sleep. By noon the bright costumed alumni crowded the streets with their bands and choruses, and in the tents there was great reunion under the orange and black banners that curled and strained in the wind. Amory looked long at one house which bore the legend sixty nine. There a few gray-haired men sat and talked quietly while the classes swept by in panorama of life. Under the Arc Light Then tragedy's emerald eyes glared suddenly at Amory over the edge of June. On the night after his ride to Lawrenceville a crowd sallied to New York in quest of adventure, and started back to Princeton about twelve o'clock in two machines. It had been a gay party, and different stages of sobriety were represented. Amory was in the car behind. They had taken the wrong road and lost the way, and so were hurrying to catch up. It was a clear night, and the exhilaration of the road went to Amory's head. He had the ghost of two stanzas of a poem forming in his mind. 
So the grey car crept nightward in the dark, and there was no life stirred as it went by. As the still ocean paths before the shark in starred and glittering waterways, beauty high, the moon-swathed trees divided pair on pair, while flapping night-birds cried across the air. A moment by an inn of lamps and shades, a yellow inn under a yellow moon, then silence where crescendo laughter fades, the car swung out again to the winds of June, mellowed the shadows where the distance grew, then crushed the yellow shadows into blue. They jolted to a stop, and Amory peered up, startled. A woman was standing beside the road, talking to Alec at the wheel. Afterward he remembered the harpy effect that her old kimono gave her, and the cracked hollowness of her voice as she spoke. "'You Princeton boys?' "'Yes.' "'Well, there's one of you killed here, and two others about dead.' "'My God!' "'Look!' she pointed, and they gazed in horror. Under the full light of a roadside arc-light lay a form, face downward in a widening circle of blood. They sprang from the car. Amory thought of the back of that head, that hair, that hair, and then they turned the form over. "'It's Dick! Dick Humbird!' "'Oh, Christ! Feel his heart!' Then the insistent voice of the old crone in a sort of croaking triumph. "'He's quite dead, all right. The car turned over. Two of the men that weren't hurt just carried the others in, but this one's no use.' Amory rushed into the house, and the rest followed with a limp mass that they laid on the sofa in the shoddy little front parlour. Sloane, with his shoulder punctured, was on another lounge. He was half delirious, and kept calling something about a chemistry lecture at eight ten. "'I don't know what happened,' said Farrenby, in a strained voice. "'Dick was driving, and he wouldn't give up the wheel. We told him he'd been drinking too much. Then there was this damn curve. Oh, my God!' He threw himself face downward on the floor and broke into dry sobs. The doctor arrived, and Amory went over to the couch, where someone handed him a sheet to put over the body. With a sudden hardness he raised one of the hands, and let it fall back inertly. The brow was cold, but the face not expressionless. He looked at the shoelaces. Dick had tied them that morning. He had tied them, and now he was this heavy white mass. All that remained of the charm and personality of the Dick Humbert he had known, oh, it was all so horrible and unaristocratic and close to the earth. All tragedy was that strain of the grotesque and squalid, so useless, futile, the way animals die. Amory was reminded of a cat that had lain horribly mangled in some alley of his childhood. "'Someone go to Princeton with Farrenby!' Amory stepped outside the door and shivered slightly at the late-night wind, a wind that stirred a broken fender on the mass of bent metal to a plaintive, tinny sound. Crescendo Next day, by a merciful chance, passed in a whirl. When Amory was by himself, his thoughts zigzagged inevitably to the picture of that red mouth yawning incongruously in the white face, but with a determined effort he piled present excitement upon the memory of it, and shut it coldly away from his mind. Isabel and her mother drove into town at four, and they rode up smiling Prospect Avenue, through the gay crowd, to have tea at Cottage. The clubs had their annual dinners that night, so at seven he loaned her to a freshman, and arranged to meet her in the gymnasium at eleven, when the upper-classmen were admitted to the freshman dance. She was all he had expected, and he was happy and eager to make that night the centre of every dream. At nine the upper classes stood in front of the clubs as the freshman torchlight parade riot had passed, and Amory wondered if the dress-suited groups against the dark stately backgrounds and under the flare of the torches made the night as brilliant to the staring, cheering freshmen as it had been to him the year before. The next day was another whirl. They lunched in a gay party of six in a private dining-room at the club, while Isabel and Amory looked at each other tenderly over the fried chicken, and knew that their love was to be eternal. They danced away the prom until five, 
and the stags cut in on Isabel with joyous abandon, which grew more and more enthusiastic as the hour grew late, and their wines, stored in overcoat pockets in the coat-room, made old weariness wait until another day. The stag-line is a most homogeneous mass of men. It fairly sways with a single soul. A dark-haired beauty dances by, and there is a half-gasping sound as the ripple surges forward, and someone sleeker than the rest darts out and cuts in. Then when the six-foot girl, brought in by K in your class, and to whom he has been trying to introduce you all evening, gallops by, the line surges back, and the groups face about, and become intent on far corners of the hall, for K, anxious and perspiring, appears elbowing through the crowd in search of familiar faces. "'I say, old man, I've got an awfully nice—sorry, K, but I'm set for this one. I've got to cut in on a fella. "'Well, the next one? "'What, uh, er, I swear I've got to go cut in. Look me up when she's got a dance free.' It delighted Amory when Isabel suggested that they leave for a while and drive around in her car. For a delicious hour that passed too soon, they glided the silent roads about Princeton, and talked from the surface of their hearts in shy excitement. Amory felt strangely ingenuous, and made no attempt to kiss her. Next day they rode up through the Jersey country, had luncheon in New York, and in the afternoon went to see a problem play at which Isabel wept all through the second act, rather to Amory's embarrassment, though it filled him with tenderness to watch her. He was tempted to lean over and kiss away her tears, and she slipped her hand into his under cover of darkness, to be pressed softly. Then at six they arrived in the Borges' summer place on Long Island, and Amory rushed upstairs to change into a dinner coat. As he put in his studs he realized that he was enjoying life as he would probably never enjoy it again. Everything was hallowed by the haze of his own youth. He had arrived, abreast of the best in his generation at Princeton. He was in love, and his love was returned. Turning on all the lights, he looked at himself in the mirror, trying to find in his own face the qualities that made him see clearer than the great crowd of people, that made him decide firmly and able to influence and follow his own will. There was little in his life now that he would have changed. Oxford might have been a bigger field. Silently he admired himself. How conveniently well he looked, and how well a dinner-coat became him. He stepped into the hall, and then waited at the top of the stairs, for he heard footsteps coming. It was Isabel, and from the top of her shining hair, to her little golden slippers, she had never seemed so beautiful. "'Isabel!' he cried, half involuntarily, and held out his arms. As in the story-books, she ran into them, and on that half-minute, as their lips first touched, rested the high point of vanity, the crest of his young egotism. End of Book One Chapter Two Part Three Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org on September 22, 2006, in Oceanside, California.